Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am so excited because I'm about to start the first season of, I'm going to start all over again. Okay. Okay. Jess, we're starting all over again. I knew I'd do this. Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited because we're about to launch the opening episode of season four. And I have a guest with me today that I had dreams about having on my show even before I launched my podcast, which was June of 2020. And my guest is none other than Ms. Lois Gibbs. Hi there, Lois. Hey. So it's a dream come true for me to have you here on my show. I'm flattered, totally <laughs> flattered. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Now, my guest, I'm sure a lot of you know who Ms. Lois Gibbs is, but for the few of you out there who don't, let me tell you a little bit about the amazing things she's done. My guest is the subject of a book coming out in April called Paradise Falls, The True Story of an Environmental Catastrophe. In 1978, Lois Gibbs discovered that her child was attending an elementary school built next to a toxic chemical dump in Niagara Falls, New York. She organized her neighbors into the Love Canal Homeowners Association and pushed for relocation for the families of Love Canal. Her opponents were Occidental Petroleum and also local, state, and federal government officials. As a result of her work, which you will all hear all about, in December of 1980, President Carter signed new federal legislation called the Superfund to address the thousands of other toxic sites across the nation. Lois has often been referred to as the mother of the Superfund. Again, welcome, Lois. Thanks. Thank you so much. So what you've done is just so incredible, but you did it without um, without any you know, special training you just mm -hmm. did what needed to be done. So, so tell, tell us what happened. I'd be happy to. And I have to say that um, I did have training from my mother, you know, that everything I did at Love Canal and, and it was a struggle and it was, it was terrifying at times. Um, it was something I learned from my mother, you know, organizing and doing this work. You don't have to have a PhD in something. You had to have a little bit of common sense. The more common sense you have, the better off you are, but you just need a little and you need a mama, you know, or someone who is, who has raised you in a way that taught you all those things you learned in kindergarten to be nice to others and to do this and, to, and so forth and so on. So, so my story is really about um, living the American dream, or at least that's how I saw it. Um, you know, I had uh, my husband, he worked at Goodyear Chemical. He was a chemical operator. You know, many people in, in places like Love Canal, spouses or partners or, you know, relatives work in the very industry we're fighting. Um, and so he worked there and we had this wonderful little ranch house and I had a brand new baby, uh, a baby boy. He was one years old. We moved into our house and I really did. I believe I had the American dream. I, I'm telling you, I had like everything. I even had the picket fence. It was so disgusting. Uh, and, and I had HBO because back then HBO was equivalent to internet now, or maybe the internet is old now. I'm old, but you know, and I just, and I'm moved in and I was, I, I can't tell you how happy I was. My husband was full, fully employed, gainfully employed, and I got to stay home and raise my child. And, um, and then all of a sudden my child was not so healthy anymore. He was born perfectly healthy. Um, and, and I'm like, what's going on? So he developed this urinary tract problem. And then he developed epilepsy and he developed um, asthma and he developed this liver problem. And I'm thinking he's now five years old. We've lived in the house four years. He started kindergarten uh, at 99th Street School, just three blocks from my home. I was on 101st Street. And I'm like, what is going on? And I picked up the newspaper like people all across the country do. And, you know, the Formosa plant, the this thing, the thing, they pick up a newspaper and they read about the dump site. And that's what I did. I read that the Love Canal dump site was three blocks from my home underneath the school that my child, my, my innocent little baby boy was attending kindergarten. I'm like, 
what is going on? And, and, and so, you know, I'm looking at this thing and it lists a bunch of chemicals, benzene, toluene, I don't even know what pronouncing them right. And, and then it said, you know, there are some human impacts from these chemicals when, when people are exposed. Most of it was based on workplace. This was many, many years ago, over 40 years ago. Um, and I'm looking at that and I'm like, seizure disorders, epilepsy, whoa, liver problems. Well, I mean, everything that was wrong with my little boy was in that newspaper. And I was just shocked. I'm like, so what which newspaper is this that you're referring to? The, the, it was the Niagara Falls Gazette and the, mm -hmm. and the journalist was Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a whole uh, expose on hazardous waste in Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is a chemical okay. city. Okay. It, it's a chemical city and there's chemicals everywhere. We smell chemicals. We smelt a good economy. I think the rest of the nation thinks of Niagara Falls as the falls. Mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> yeah, well, don't stand in the mist too long because <laughs> what's in that mist is probably not healthy for you or anyone else. So, so, you know, so, I, so this is what I started learning, you know, I thought, my goodness, you know, I went to, I went to school and I learned that government works and, and if you're right and you play by the rules and all that kind of stuff that, you know, it would be fine. So what did I do? I said, called up the school and said, no, my son's not coming to the school anymore. This is a public school. Um, and it's built on top of a dump site. <laughs> you know, please transfer my child to another school. And the, the school superintendent school said, no, we're not going to do that. Because of one irate, hysterical housewife with a sickly child. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not an irate, hysterical housewife with a sickly child. I'm a mom who has a healthy baby boy four years ago when I moved into this home and then he went to the school. So at the time I was just thinking, you know, that the, they would move them because it just it was illogical. There's 20,000 tons of chemicals underneath the school. Why would they not move the children away from there? Right. Not just my child, but all of the children. Well, the lesson I learned there that, you know, people should pay attention to this lesson, if nothing else. When I went there by myself and said, I had a sickly kid and I want you to help me. They turned their nose up to me and, and I was left with no solution to the problem. So I went out and went door to door to start a schools campaign. Most people don't know this. Love Canal didn't start as a Love Canal public health community wide thing. It was actually about closing the elementary school built on top of the dump. And when I went door to door and talked to people, I realized that it was not just little children who are at the school, but Adults were having these serious problems. Women were unable to maintain pregnancies. Um, children were born with birth defects. Grown men were, were dying of diseases that were unheard of, you know, and, and, and it's like, what is going on? And so I originally was getting the petition to close the school. And when I realized that, it's like, no, there's something more going on in this. And this is when we formed the Love Canal Homeowners, because I knew if I went with my petition and went and talked to it, I still wouldn't get any, you know, any result. But so we formed a Love Canal Homeowners Association to say, we want to know what's going on here. We want to know why these problems are. And, and you would look I know lots of people don't have basements. My, my family all moved to Texas these days. None of them have any basements. But in the basements of the homes around Love Canal, you could see the black oil substance coming through the cement wall into the home. And now these chemicals- Sounds like a were, nightmare. I mean, it sounds like a movie, like a B-weight movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it actually looked like mold. So, you know, when you see these home improvement programs and they have this black mold crawling up there, that's what it looked like, but it wasn't mold. It was oil. It was instead. And, and they're, they're chemicals that they call them volatile chemicals, but they're chemicals that evaporate. And so when they came into the home, they would, this is, we're talking Niagara Falls. This is a very cold climate and you have heat on three quarters of the year, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they come in the home and then when the heat is on, they get circulated throughout the whole home because the heat draws the volatile chemicals into the home and circulates it. So, you know, we're finding all of these things and we are scared to death. So we pushed really hard, the bunch of us, and said, we want a health study done here. We want to know what's going on. And the health department refused to. They refused to do a study. And the reason they refused to do a study is the same reason they refuse everywhere. It's because if they do a study and they find something, then they have to take action. 
It's not because they don't want to know. It's because they don't want to pay. And it's just, I mean, we're innocent people, right? And so we got the health department finally to agree to do a study after we did our own study. And what we found, and later the health department found, was that 56% of the children born at Love Canal, over half of the children born at Love Canal during the study period, which was four years, were born with birth defects. They had three ears, double rows of teeth, extra fingers, extra toes, or were mentally retarded. We found that there were 22 women who were pregnant during the time we were collecting the data, doing the study. And of those 22 pregnancies, only four normal babies were born. The rest of those pregnancies ended up in a miscarriage, a stillborn baby, or a child with a birth defect. And the health department found that too. What we wanted at this point is we needed to get out. We needed to be evacuated. We could not live in these homes with the chemicals circulating in our homes and in the backyards and in the ground and the school. We couldn't send our children to school. That was contaminated too. And we were unable to you know, have children and, and have healthy children. And we had all these other diseases. So we're asking the health department to move us to, to you know, issue an order and move us out. And they, and they did what they said. Well, they did some. What they said is that, and again, these are political decisions. These are not human health, public health decisions like we see often in you know, COVID nowadays, right? These are, these are political decisions. So they came back and they said, yes, we, we agree with you that over half the children were born with birth defects. We agree that the pregnancies are ending in miscarriages and stillborns and so forth. But we don't believe that it's related to the 20,000 tons of chemicals in the center of the neighborhood. We believe that it's related to a random clustering of genetically defected people. It's just impossible, right? I mean, it, I mean, it is possible. If you throw a quarter enough times against a wall, it will come up heads enough, you know, more than tails or whatever. And I, I like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what, what are you, we are not related. You know, none of us are related. We're a fairly young group of, uh, of homeowners. And, and yeah, so then, so then we kept on pushing and that was the key is you just had to keep on pushing. And we did it as women, women have incredible power. And I don't say this, you know, there's all the sexist and stuff like that. And people really put me down because I say this, but I'm telling you, women have more power than men ever had. And a woman with a child in her arm is the one the politician is looking at. They're not looking at the man with the fists. They're not looking at the angry other person over there. It's the woman with the child that they're paying attention to because that's what the public is paying attention to. And so we stood there with our children in our arms and we demanded that they do something. And they did. They agreed to move pregnant women and children under the age of two. That if you had a child who was two and a half or two and two days for that matter, you couldn't leave. And if you weren't pregnant and your children are all old, you couldn't leave. So what did that do? That encouraged people to get pregnant in an area where you don't want to get pregnant because the children are being born, you know, so birth defected and the pregnancies are so, so, so we continued to fight and we fought as moms with our children. We were appealing to the bigger public we knew that New York State was not going to do the right thing because of the right reason. They're going to do what is politically advantageous because of the costs involved. And because we were the first, the precedent it would set. Whatever they do at Love Canal, they will have to do everywhere else. And so we continued to push and push and push. And it took us quite some time. Um, and we did this with stepping outside of our comfort zone. You know, I was a very shy, quiet mom. I was, you know, I didn't even answer, ask questions at the PTA meeting. I would ask my friend, Debbie, <laughs> we went to school together. Debbie, ask him about the budget. Ask him about this. I was like, I wouldn't ask anything. Um, but you learn that you really have to speak up and, um, and you have to do what you have to do. And, and that is what we learned. And so we, we went outside our comfort zones. We held protests. I never was in a protest before. I know I'm of the hippie era. I am one of those people. I never went to college. I never, I never did a, 
burnt my bra or whatever else they were doing. I, I wasn't of that. Um, and yet here I am burning President Carter in effigy with my neighbors. And we're doing a, a you know, a, a prayer vigil with the candles and praying for, you know, we're doing all these sort of things. And each and every time we're doing this, we're we're targeting the governor of New York State, who we knew had the political power. Was he responsible? No, he didn't put the dump there. He didn't poison our families. He didn't build the houses. He didn't say it was OK. He didn't put the school there, but he could get us out. Mm -hmm. And so so we went after him and said he could go after Hooker Chemical, who is a responsible party in this case, who did do all of that to get re reimburse the state and the taxpayers. We didn't think the taxpayers should have to pay for it. We think the chemical companies should have to pay for it. So long story short, we kept the pressure on him and um, did all of these sort of things. And ultimately in um, October of 1980, so we started in the spring of 1978. So it was relatively short, um, but that's because we created so much national publicity. The more publicity you can get at a national level that educates the American people, the American public, which was really about the American voters. So the more you can influence voters about your cause and getting the person or the agency to do the right thing, the more likely you are to succeed. Well, because we were the first, it was harder, but because we were the first, it was easier because it, we, the media never covered anything like this before. It was all new. I mean, every day was a new new news day, no matter what we were doing, it was new news. And so, so as a result of that, all 900 families were evacuated from Love Canal. People were told that they could sell their home to the state of New York and take the money outside of whatever they're you know, earning. And like, or if they're having their mortgage, if they have a little mortgage, then you know, they had to pay that off and they could go buy a house wherever they want it and, um, you know, move their families out. And all the schools, there's two schools, actually 99th Street, the one I referred to and 93rd Street School. And both of those schools were closed and the area was um, was fenced off and people were gone. And it, you know, once congratulations, Thanks. congratulations, Con I'm. Uh, over and over, congratulations. And there's, it also comes with some heartbreak because all these conditions and these problems and probably much death because of this. So that's a, so that on the one hand, it's, it's something to be congratulated for. It's also sad, mm -hmm. but, but you got to look at the positive. Right. And I, you know, and it is, it is very sad. I mean, when you're talking about these children, uh, our children who have birth defects, you know, those are children who whose life has been altered um, by no fault of the parents. Right. Right. Um, and all of those women who lost their children. I remember there was this one this one woman who had twins. And this is really at the beginning, like July of 1978, when we first started. And and she realized that both of her twins died. And when she asked the state health department, they did not know that her twins just died. But when she asked the health department about breast milk, they said, oh, well, if you're breastfeeding, you should not do that while living at Love Canal. You could harm your children. That woman almost committed suicide because she oh. killed her child. Right. Oh. That's I mean, that's how that's how she's seen it. Of course, she oh. did not. Oh, she's entirely gosh. innocent. Um, but she lost her two babies. And, you know, was it her breast milk? Was it not her breast milk? Who knows? You know, no one's ever going to know. But, you know, those kind of tragedies, people's lives have been altered forever. The positive part of it is that Love Canal did set this precedent. I mean, those those families were going to lose their lives irregardless. It was just it was it was happening. Right. Um, but we set this precedent. Yes. So if you have contamination, you can get relocated. Yes. And since since Love Canal, through the organization I work with, the Center for Health, Environment and Justice, we have helped 16 communities get relocated Fantastic. away from toxic chemicals successfully. So so, you know, there's there's a lot of tragedy, but there's a lot of good. And I think yes. the the one lesson that that I would like to share is, that I think is the most important, regardless of what issue you're working on, is that. In a democracy, and that's where we live, we live in a democracy. In a democracy, we can change the world. You get enough people standing together, 
speaking as one, asking for something that's absolutely necessary, you can get it. I mean, that was a thing that like, oh my gosh, we got the president of the United States to come to our community, to our stage and say, you can be evacuated and I'm appropriating X amount of dollars for that to happen. And it wasn't because we were right, although we were, or because we were sick, although we were, it was because it was politically advantageous for President Carter, who was losing his second term election, which he did lose, by the way, um, that he was losing, that he wanted to come and look like a hero. And fine, look like a hero, just give us what we need in order for us to live, work and play and pray, you know, because we can't do it here at Love Canal. It was a strategy and it worked. It is. A, it, it was, was a strategy a very good strategy and it worked. Well, mm-hmm. this this is a, a very inspiring, um, very courageous what you did, um, especially when you tell us that you you actually uh, used to think of yourself as shy and quiet and for you to speak out the way you did. So um, I would love to ask you a couple of questions if that's okay. Oh yeah, sure. So you, um, you spoke about something that there's a, that you'll see a lot of listeners are probably have the exact same issues that they see a problem in their community, but they're afraid to speak out because their family members or spouses or cousins or uncles might work for a company Mm -hmm that where they're trying to change things. And that's, mm-hmm. that's not unusual with me at the, um, when I wrote my book and I was trying to um, speak out against the Army Corps of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers is a huge employer in New mm-hmm. Orleans. And that was a problem for me in recruiting people uh, to, to join my group. Mm-hmm. So, so what, what advice do you have for people, uh, for our listeners who, who feel stopped by that? Um, that concern about relative family members. Yeah, it's a real problem. But you know what? 90% of our community worked in the industry. They didn't all work for Hooker, although Hooker was one of them. There was Hooker, Goodyear, NL. I mean, name your polluter. <laughs> it was there. Um, and, you know, here, here's where they drew the line. They drew the line when it was making their family sick. You know, there was really so one of the things that was really interesting is when I went door to door and people were talking about the chemicals and I was talking about the chemicals, they understood what those chemicals were. They didn't need to be educated because they worked with those chemicals. Mm -hmm. And the one gentleman said to me, well, you know, Miss Lois, that's the same chemical that I get paid extra to work with in the plant because it's so toxic and it's in my backyard. And I'm not letting my wife and children out there. So, so there was the there was an understanding that this is not about jobs. And and one of the things we had in in our favor is we had a very strong uh, union, the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union at the time, and they did the analysis on Hooker and Occidental Petroleum, and they was really clear that they're not leaving town. That you know they can threaten all they want about leaving town, they weren't going to leave town, and so I thought that that documentation was very helpful um, to to move forward. And not everybody's going to do it, you know. Everybody's going to say, "I'm scared, I'm scared." What you have to what you have to say is like, you can be scared, but you don't sacrifice your life for a job. And it's when not you spoke it. out, you gave courage to others. Yes. When they saw your courage, then they had courage. Yes. Uh, after you spoke out. Yeah. So uh, thank you. And thank we you. also and we yeah. also let we also let those who are working in the plant sort of be behind the scenes as much as possible. As much as and possible. those of us because I was I was not employed so I could be in front, you know, so that was the other thing. And it's not shaming them because they choose to be behind the scene. It's OK to be behind the scene as long as you're helping us to move forward. Right. Not hindering it. So Absolutely. that was the other thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you at, uh, first uh, went, this is so interesting. So uh, I, I was just getting ready to say this should be a book. And I remember it is a book <laughs> and it's coming out in a couple of months. Um, so, yeah, the name the name of the book um, is Paradise Falls, the true story of an environmental catastrophe. Uh, what's the name, the author's name? Uh, Keith O'Brien. Keith O'Brien. And, and he's an I understand he's a New York Times bestselling author. Mm -hmm. There you go. So I've I've already ordered my copy. All right. (laughs) Right. So, but when you was just you and, and you went to the school 
and you wanted you to transfer your child mm -hmm. to another school. And, and mm -hmm. so it was just you. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did they make you feel as a human being when you asked, asked for that? Oh, like a historical, a hysterical woman who has her period. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And this but, isn't that long ago. This isn't the 1800s. No. This is 1978. So they made yeah. you feel. Yeah. Like, like what, the whole. It's they, all in actually, your head. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like having some hormone imbalance kind of thing that, you know, they felt sorry for me because I had a sickly kid. If but you whatever. could go back in time, knowing what you know now. Yeah. What, what do you think you would have said that day? I don't Just, think I would have went there. Well, I would have gone. I would have yeah. gotten. Yeah, I would have got my petition right. first and then went okay. there. But but here's the other thing that's interesting. So when people do this, when you go, you have a problem with the school or whomever, you know, what was really interesting is they had. So Dr. Long was at this big old desk, this big old wooden desk. Right. Uh, as you imagine, school teachers have and principals and the chair for the guest was a student chair. So it's like a wonderful life where you're way, way down here looking over the top of his desk. So even the dynamics of the of the seating are you know, stacked that, against you. Yeah, you're put down, literally put down. Yeah, it's like little. looking. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's oh my gosh. Yeah, so it was this is, but then you realized um I, I also um, sat up and took note to something else you said that a petition wasn't enough. You needed a group of people. Right. It, petitions are great. You can get people to sign, but you felt what you really needed was a group of people. Right. Because when you have a petition, it, it shows that you have community support mm -hmm. in, in a vague sort of way. Mm -hmm. But when, so when we had a meeting and we had one every other week, I mean, it was just crisis time. Uh, I don't advise people to do that, by the way, but we did. Mm -hmm. um, we had 500 people at every one of those meetings. Wow. When you That's have 500 impressive. people in a meeting, then people are paying attention. If you have 10,000 signatures on a petition, people are going to kind of pay attention because it's again, it's all about optics. It's all about optics. And we're really looking at not the not the problem not the problem that people are sick and not the problem the dump is leaking. We're looking from their perspective, they're looking at what's going to get me reelected. I mean, I, I know that sounds really cynical, but it's also so true. It's and realistic. So it being realistic. And, and that's one of the things I'd like to do uh, with my show is I, mm -hmm. I don't want to be Pollyanna and, and give people expectations that that first of all, that it's going to happen overnight. Nothing happens overnight. Some things right. do. Um, yeah. My organization, when I launched my my petition just to get people to to, to join my group, I used the petition mm -hmm. to join the group. We had right. 200 people overnight. And that's exciting. Yeah. And you can get those kind of successes. But that didn't really accomplish the mission or the goals. Right. It just grew the group. So, um, right. So you had 200 names. But if you didn't find a way to engage those 200 people, right, they were gone tomorrow. And I think that's that's the difference between a, a petition and then a petition with something, you know, using that for a building block for an organization, yeah, step but it's stone. the organization yes. that makes a difference. Right. Absolutely. So that Otherwise, really you would never you... know where they lived. You know, how could you, how could you engage them? They had to sign your petition, right. To, for you to find who they are and where they are. Right. Exactly. And you also <laughs> noticed that you had to do your own study, uh, mm -hmm. had to do your own research. And too often, I mean, I, I've seen it over and over and over again, where the, the people who are harmed by these chemicals are harmed mm -hmm. by plastics or by, by um, chemicals, or PFOAs or, or C8, so mm -hmm. that they are the ones that have to prove they're sick. And, right. and I, it makes me so angry, but, but you all did something about it. You did your own research. Now, did you, um, did you find a researcher or did you all do this yourselves? Or how did the study come together? Yeah, no, we did find a researcher, Dr. Pagan, um, and she was working at uh, Cancer Research Institute, and she came out to help us uh, do the door-to-door -door survey and the questions we were going to ask and stuff like that. And so she was incredibly helpful. And it's really true. The vast majority of, of places what we've heard about communities getting sick, including, you know, Aaron Brockovich days, mm -hmm. that, that was a community 
door to door. It wasn't an epidemiologist going out there. It wasn't statisticians going or toxicologists. It was a regular person knocking on the door and saying, what's what's going on here? Making us doing a survey and doing mm-hmm. the survey. survey. And, it, and, it, and those surveys really matter. And the other thing we did is we didn't. So so you can't prove you're sick. Because, you know, statistically, it says we're a random clustering of genetically defective people. You see, you can't really prove why you're sick. You can prove maybe you're sick, but not why you're sick, how the chemicals got to you. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we created the story, the frame and the message line by saying, by having, we, this is very sad. (laughs) This is terrible, but we used to call it the horror story of the week. We would find a mom with a sickly child, Barbara Quimby and her child, Brandy has three major birth defects. And then we would send a journalist from, you know, a local newspaper, New York Times somewhere uh, to go because human interest stories, they love to do human interest stories. It's their favorite thing. Um, And so we'd send a journalist to do a human interest story about what was happening to Barbara Quimby and her daughter, Brandy. And Barbara was trained to say, and it's the governor or the president, whoever our target was, right? Who, who's making me stay here and making Brandy stay here and da, 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 da. And all of a sudden it's like, so that what does a journalist do? It's a lovely human interest story. And then they call the governor's office and say, well, she said this, what's your comment? No comment. No comment's a good comment. I like no comment because that means somebody asked. Mm-hmm. And if somebody asked, that mm-hmm. ups your political power. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they know that somebody is asking, somebody is looking and they so so, you know, we we found that that works. And so we did a lot of these human interest stories around um, around our health studies. So when we talked about birth defects, you know, Brandy and Barbara, you know, they were the perfect sort of look and see. You know, they're lovely. It's so true. I I want to um, emphasize what Lois is talking about, the human interest story. Um, People love a story and they love a story about people. When I launched levies.org, I tried to stay in the background. I didn't I didn't like talking about myself. And I very quickly learned I was going to have to give up on all that. (laughs) And I got asked every question in the book. And every time the news wanted to do a story, it had to be me. They wouldn't mm-hmm. accept anybody else. And it, it's just that the way it is. They, the news media yeah. wants, uh, wants a story and they also want a face to the lead the group. Wouldn't you say that's true, Lois? Right. Yes. 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 And just accept yeah, they, it. Yeah. The and, it, and it the is. public reacts to that. They don't react yeah. to statistics and numbers. And, and most of the time people just glaze over those things. Right. It's like, oh, so sorry for those people, whoever those right. people are, right? Right. But Barbara and Brandy, oh my gosh, that yeah. poor girl, mm-hmm. that poor the girl, she story. wants to have another baby and the she horror... can't have another baby. Yeah. The, yeah. the horror story of the week, um, but mm-hmm. but it worked. It worked. It was a strategy and it worked. And then, and I'm sure you tried some strategies that didn't work and it's okay. We tried yeah. something that didn't work. I know I, I know I did, speaking for myself, <laughs> things I tried that I thought would be so great and didn't didn't work yeah. at all. And then and then fortunately a lot some of the things do. I wanted to really though, um, you you were hesitant about saying it, but I, I think you're absolutely right about the power of a woman and her baby. Mm-hmm. You see, a woman holding her baby is an unpaid, um, uh, unpaid advocate. OK, mm-hmm. they're not receiving mm-hmm. compensation for what they're doing. Right. Right. They are fighting for their communities and their families, right. for, their, for their health and for their very lives. Mm-hmm. And that is so powerful. OK, yeah. um, and I think that I, I don't think you mean it as sexist. I, you were just explaining right. a truth. And in, in the in the face of the big guys, mm-hmm. the opponent, you are powerful because they, they know that they know you're, you're doing this. It, because your heart is in the right place and not because right. you're punching a time clock. Right. 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 Exactly. You don't, I mean, your conflict of interest is your family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's your conflict right. of interest, right? It's right. why you're doing it. You're doing your family. Do you doing it for your community? Um, and, and I mean, the other thing is that the woman with the child is the same people that they're kissing on their political campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. They go into the crowds and they glad shake and whatever that thing is and hug the little kids. And it's like, because it matters to the American people that women and children matter and women and children in neighborhood matter. You know, they just matter, whether it's a inner city neighborhood or, you know, somewhere out West, it matters. And Mm -hmm. so 
anytime a, a politician is connected with something that's harming that thing that matter, then they're in trouble and they know it. And that's why they, that's why they respond. Exactly. And the, so yeah, what, what we're, so we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to um, emphasize is when you're perceived as doing this for no other reason than for mm -hmm. your family or your community, that's when you have power. Okay. Yeah. And that's why a mom and her child is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. that is, that strikes fear in the heart of the big guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then something else you said that was really, really important. And we're about one out of time, but we have time for this is you, you were able to get national press. And, and I am very critical in many ways of national press, because I think national, I think a lot of the, the big media uh, um, is uh, uh, controlled by business. Right. And, and I have my issues with big mm -hmm. media. On the other hand, I am the first person to say, if you can get national press to further the reach of your message, go for it. Absolutely go for it. Uh, because that can be a, a super big help to getting your message out and to getting more allies and getting more message mm -hmm. out and getting more allies. Okay. So it's a love hate relationship that I have with big media. Uh, I can count on one hand, the number of reporters that I respect. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, uh, the value of media cannot be understated. And, and uh, my main thing I, I warn my listeners is don't let the, the me, don't let the media decide whether your work is important. In other words, if the media doesn't cover your story, don't consider don't consider that right. evidence of the of the value of right. your work. Right. right? right. So, so just get past that. In the right. meanwhile, keep trying to get your story out. Uh, so how were you able to get the attention of national media? Lois? Well, we, uh, you know what it is? Human interest. You know, a lot of people think if I do this big report on climate or if I do this report on whatever, you know, the media, all the talking heads. No, it's human interest. And and it's just like TV. And I know this is this is just as you're exactly right. You know, they are corporate. They are whatever. But um, you have a good guy and a bad guy mm -hmm. and a human interest story. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, we went on Phil Donahue, a lot of your new, oh. new people won't know who they are, but I know, uh, I, I know who they are, but you know, who they are. so, so Phil Donahue has like a talk show, sort of like Oprah's show. And I don't know, Ellen, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, we went on there the first time I went on, I blew it because I was talking about statistics and da, 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 da. And it was terrible. Oh, it was terrible. I got no, no reaction. Right. The second time we went on, we talked about Barbara Quimby's daughter, Brandy, mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. happened to Brandy? And, and, mm -hmm. and it's not fair. Barbara wants another child, but she can't have a child because like, and then we talked about 56% birth defect. Let me tell you what that looks like. Let me tell you about this. Let me, you know, and it made it a human interest. And suddenly, literally suddenly, everybody in the, in the federal government in Carter's office was calling me and wanting to know what to go on. You know, what, what's going on? What are you doing? So capture they, their interest with the human story and then then give them the statistics right. and then with a good gotta, guy and a bad guy you got to have you know for national media you got to have the good guy and the bad guy you got to say i mean not necessarily bad bad but jimmy carter could fix this problem he chooses not to our children are dying we we have a right to live we have a right to breathe jimmy carter you know and so it's a good guy bad guy kind of because that's what that's what tv is right that's what news media is it's them and this yeah and so we so we were incredibly successful i do have to say one other thing that did it is we held hostages for five hours so some epa people came to talk to us in may of 1980 um and uh we decided if it was so darn safe to live at love canal which is what they came to tell us then they could live there so we put them in one of the abandoned houses and we encircled them with women 500 women just circled around the house, sat down and wouldn't let them out huh. and called the White House and said, we're holding your EPA officials um, hostage, but not really. We're just protecting them against the 500 people out in the front lawn who want to rip them apart. So you need to deal with us. And we so in the, in the, there's a long story to it. But the short story uh, is that we gave them the White House Wednesday till noon. This was on a on a Saturday, Wednesday till noon 
to give us relocation. Otherwise, and the famous quote is my quote, otherwise what we did there today, meaning holding hostage, what we did today will look like a Sesame Street picnic to what we're going to do Wednesday at noon. So, you know, it's the mom thing. It's like Sesame Street picnic. It's like, yeah, I don't know. Um, is it Wednesday precisely at noon? The White House called and said everybody could leave temporarily and permanent relocation was their goal. And that's when that happened in October, um, just a few months later. But, you know, it was, it was about, it was about really making it family focused, people focused. Mm -hmm. You have a lot really of wins. power. Um, I bet you surprised yourself by how much power you have, you know. Oh, absolutely. I, I bet you didn't know. <laughs> I, I, I can only share one cute story that happened recently where I, I did something like that. I, I had an exclusive. I offered it to a uh, I was at an event and I had an exclusive okay. story and I walked up to a reporter. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, said, I'd like to offer you an exclusive. You have until noon. Um, let me know. Uh, if you want it or not, I'll just bring the story elsewhere at exactly noon, exactly when I say, I mean, exactly like, like this, uh, they called and said, they'll take the story. It, it's interesting how things like that work. I th almost think right. they love the challenge. They, they, yeah, they, I just they think respect it's, the challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's you saying, well, maybe, maybe you're being very definitive. I got other mm -hmm. options. You yeah. can, you can take it or, you know, there's other people out there. And I wasn't mean about it. I wasn't ugly. No, right. I was right. just, this is the way it is. Um, right. It's yours. You have till noon to decide. So is yeah. there, we're about one out of time. Is there anything else that you, that you can't sleep tonight uh, if you don't <laughs> share with our listeners right now? Uh, I think the only thing I would share is I'm a shining example. I am not special in any sort of way. I'm a shining example of how an average person can really tackle any problem, you know? And I, like I said, you know, when, when I was in a, in a, problem. I tried to figure out how to get out of it. I just referred back to my mother. What did my mother do when these two people, when two of us kids were fighting with each other, she distracted us. Oh, okay. So I distracted people, you know, to take what you have inside you, what you already know, don't self doubt yourself and, and move forward. Any of us could do it. And the key is that all of us got to do it. You know, it's really, it's really up to us. Our yeah. politicians aren't going to save us. We know the corporations aren't going to save us. So you know, if we don't, then. It, it is up to us in many ways and we can do it. If anybody would like to, uh, if any of our listeners would like to follow your work or um, get more involved, or to know more about what you're doing, what would you suggest? I suggest they go to our website. And, and that is chej.org. So www.chej.org says Center for Health, Environment and Justice. Uh, and in there, you can find different issues you might care about. You can find out how to get on our newsletter. Um, you can make a donation. You can volunteer time, whatever. It's all there. Thank you. And of course, you've got a book coming out, which uh, in April of this year, and would, I've already ordered my copy and I highly encourage our listeners to do the same. It's, it's really a great book. I just finished it myself. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait. So um, anyway, thank you again, Lois Gibbs, for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Okay, stay with me. Still trying to use my mouse with my right hand. <laughs> <laughs>